Hello and a very warm welcome to Weekly Current Affairs. Today is Saturday and we will be taking up current affairs that have been published in various newspaper articles in the last one week. And we will be taking up miscellaneous topics in today's session. Welcome to today's session and my name is Madhusudan Reddy. Today we will be taking up three different articles. Our first article is based upon a hydroelectric power project which is in Uttarakhand and because of this a cultural issue that has been raised we are going to link up both of these things and we will take it further. Our second article where we are going to deal with the hydrophonics also where the vertical farming issues which are associated in India and the types of vertical farming. And lastly, the third article which we are going to deal with is the battery waste management rules. In the battery waste management rules have been given after 20 odd years there is an amendment rules that have been published that is battery waste, ma battery waste management rules of 2022. The last time these rules were given was way back in 2001. So after 20 odd years we have got these new rules and in the, these new rules there are also responsibilities that are given to the producer to consumer, someone who recycles it, someone who uses it and also someone who refurbishes it. Now they wanted to establish such set of rules for the battery related activities because our life in the future is going to be battery dependent, right. So let us quickly get into these topics one by one. So if you see there are news, news articles which are related to battery. See here, battery makers have to comply with the new norms. Now, what are these new norms? These new norms are nothing but battery waste management rules of 2022. So, what are these rules? What are we going to deal with is something we are going to look forward for. Firstly, these, if at all, if I have to ask you a question, the battery waste management rules erstwhile till date are managed through which act? If you know the answer, please comment in the comment section, right? See, firstly, the Environmental Protection Act of 1986 gives the inception to these battery waste management rules. So, the evolution of batteries was not very old. They have been using only the extensive and rapid usage of the batteries have been very recent times, hardly a two decades phenomena. So, only the Environmental Protection Act of 18, 1986 came into picture and it said that under this we are going to create some management and handling rules of the 2001, back 20 years before these rules were given. Under these rules they said that the producer do not have any responsibility, it is the consumer who should have the responsibility and we need not need to produce and also EPR, extended producer responsibilities were not given to the producer, right. Now, the new rules of the battery waste management of 2022 came up saying that if you are a producer of a battery, now it is also your responsibility to take care of the recycling of that battery after the consumer has been used, right? So, in the last few weeks, we have discussed about a law or an act that is Right to Repair Act, if you remember. See, Right to Repair Act is something when a product, is, product comes into the market, what we do? We have the right to use and we should also have as a consumer that we can repair it. So if you have a phone, that phone can run only for 5 to 7 years. After that, the phone will no longer be in a position to run on its own. It is because the phone or the materials are designed in such a way that they have to be dead. But if you have, if you are given an opportunity to repair them, don't you think that the life of these products will increase? If you have the opportunity to increase the life of a battery, don't you think that the product life will be increased? Yes, it definitely increases which will indirectly reduce the burden on the environment. Similarly, the battery waste management rules of the 2022 will also lead to the environmental problems jo hai, unko reduction pathway pe leke jana chahti. I mean, it wants to go in the reduction pathway of the environmental impact, right? So, see here, it is the Environmental Protection Act of 1986 and the Battery Waste Management Rules of 2001. This is now being replaced by Battery Waste Management Rules of 2022. So here, from the preliminary point of view, you have to understand that it is still the Environmental Protection Act is the umbrella act under which your battery waste management rules are there, right? The amendment has only been taken for the rules that are given in the 2001 is now being replaced in 2022. Now you have to understand the rules of 2001 and rules of the 2022 and also understand the changes and the evolution from 2001 se lekar 2022 tak. We never had the battery vehicles back then, 
today we have battery vehicles we have battery led running equipments if you look into the united states there mostly today's the new cars that are bought the overall chunk if you see the number of cars that are bought are mostly battery related cars and every vehicle that you use has a battery every remote that you use is a battery the phone has a battery even these markers have a battery everything in and around your day to day life is now battery related life right so under this what are the rules and regulations that are given for the producer that we have to see right before that let us quickly look into what are these laws and also who matlab this law is applicable to who among the following right so is it producers consumers or also someone who uses or also transportation which is involved in this is this transportation also taken into consideration under this the answer is yes see it is a transformative step this transformative step is used to create a circular economy in the battery life right so for example you are a producer you produce the battery and you release it to the market right for your production you need some raw materials right that raw materials where do you get from you start to mine you buy from various sources now if at all i give you an option to reduce the raw materials instead you going and buying out somewhere i as a government will give you an option that you will get the raw materials from the same material which you have produced and when it goes into the market it can be recycled and can be used for your production so under this it is a cyclical economy which can be used in your battery life where the raw materials which you have used for the same battery it goes around the usage time period comes back and you can use it right this is what the aim of these rules under this this rules are applicable to people who are producers also who are also dealers who are also consumers apart from this there are entities that are involved in this collection now what are these entities entities are nothing but segregation transportation and refurbishment so someone who is involved in the transportation also these rules are applicable to them right segregation of this waste that means today if you are say, staying in a city that means every day one or the other person who will come to collect the waste now these battery rules are applicable to those persons also it is said that you as a consumer you have to segregate the waste and give it now you cannot throw in the bins wherever you want you have to throw do this kind of material in certain designated areas only now in this the responsibilities are also given to the consumer also given to the producer also given to the person who is also trans under used under the transportation and also for the government agencies as well right now these rules cover all type of batteries all type of batteries means small batteries big batteries even which are used in the rockets also right now what are these different types of batteries that also we should look for the preliminary examination point of view see in today's usage there are nine different types of batteries under these nine different types of batteries lithium ion is some of the majorly used battery right and l lead acid batteries jo hai mostly they are used in the vehicular uh, usages and also you have alkaline batteries along with that sealed lead acid batteries now this sealed lead acid batteries are the batteries which are using in the cameras chote chote cameras if you use the gopro if you are aware of it there are small cameras that are used in that cameras this sealed lead acid batteries are used that means this battery is completely sealed right and also nickel this methyl hydrocarbonate batteries or hybrid batteries are also used along with that coin batteries jo chote watches mein use kiya jata hai and zinc air batteries as well as zinc carbon batteries now all the different types of batteries are taken into consideration in the waste management rules of the 2022 which are dealing with the battery right apart from this now let's quickly look into the functions of the producer see functions of the producer from the examination point of view here we have to understand the extended producer responsibility now what do you mean by extended producer responsibility for example let me try to explain you this through an small image here see if at all you go to buy this battery you bought this battery then after the usage the consumer buys this products and uses this product after some time the producer has the responsibility to collect the wastage that is generated by this consumer now where do you deliver or you throw this waste you have to throw this waste in a designated area right this designated area will now be taken care by government 
see designated area means nothing much it is simply the daily laborer who comes to your home and collects the waste now you give that waste that person will take this batteries to a different place and store or segregate it and deliver it to the producer right so ultimately it is the duty of the producer to get back all of this now you as a producer can also say that i have produced 100 odd batteries and i got only 20 batteries back now where are these 80 batteries do you think that how are we going to account all of this for this the government has also announced that there is going to be an auditing program under this auditing program how many sellers are there how many buyers are there tomorrow from the next month onwards if you are going to buy a battery your address will also be taken right that means your contact details will also be taken so that in the later time period whenever there is an auditing don't know how far this this is going to be reality but in a visionary aspects this is one of the finest steps that are being taken by the battery waste management rules right so this particular process is called extended producer responsibility now why is this called extended producer responsibility because the producer is given certain responsibilities beyond its only production functions right now epr mandates that all the waste batteries be collected and sent for recycling or also for refurbishment or else it is also prohibiting the disposal in landfills and incineration processes right this is what is called as extended producer responsibility under this this is the major function that is given to the producer right now nextly there are also functions that are given to the consumer and also there are functions that are given to the waste management authorities like your municipal corporations or your municipalities right firstly let's see what are the functions of the consumer there are two different functions of the consumer under this the functions of the consumer involves the waste batteries yoga separately from other waste streams ko inko separately rakhna chahiye domestic waste need to be separated from the waste of electric waste right and secondly giving them the an entirely engaged in collection or refurbishment of recycling it means to say that to ensure the waste batteries are disposed of in an environment friendly manner some awareness campaigns will be taken and also some kind of engagements where the public will be involved in that is what the cc central pollution control board is trying to aim for that now what are the functions of the management waste management in authorities it is clearly mentioned that in simple terms it means to say that the segregation is also the role and responsibility of the government right so it also involved the local bodies and local authorities as well so this is what is nothing but decentralization process which is involved in the collection and segregation of the waste management even in the municipalities as well right now central pollution control board came into picture they have also given some kind of authorities they said that now we are going to build up an online portal wherein we are also going to use some kind of auditing mechanisms that kitne batteries produce hua kitne usage hua tha kitne waste unke paas aa gaya management authority ke paas and how are they reporting it now where are the other batteries or other material that is going into these things which the central pollution control board is going to develop an online portal is type ki portal develop kiya jayega in mein sare stakeholders all the stakeholders will be taken into consideration and their concerns will be addressed you can also go and complain that if there is some person who is throwing batteries outside that person can also be punished right they are also prescribing certain amount of usage of recycled material kitna recycled material should be used while refurbishing and re, uh, again remanufacturing the material these kind of rules have been engaged and imparted in the battery waste management rules so mostly this is a prelims related article and also mains related article where the mains examination may you can use to give the passing references right so in may say online registration bhi hoga online reporting bhi hoga online auditing bhi hoga and there will be committees that will be looked after right so out of all this in the from the examination point of view you should also look forward for environmental concerns that are related with batteries as well and also the hazardous diseases that are associated with battery for example you take lead you take cadmium you also take any other harmful uh, chemicals that are used in the battery there have some diseases associated with it 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 disease cadmium or mercury pollution ki karan we have come up with many conventions so this is a landmark landmark rules that have come into picture these rules should have been come back a decade earlier but nevertheless it is none not too late any time that the rules have come into picture in some or the other way they are going to help and reduce the wastage of the battery in the near future right this is what is all about this article now looking to the next article our next article 
talks about that World Bank agrees to look into construction of the Uttarakhand Dam. So, see here clearly World Bank is agreeing to look into the construction of the Uttarakhand Dam. Now, why is a World Bank which is far far away is trying to come to Uttarakhand and is also looking into the construction of the Uttarakhand Dam? This is what is the first question which you have to know. Now, what is the name of this dam? Vishnu Gard. Okay. Vishnu Gard Pipalakoti Dam. Now, this Vishnu Gard Pipalakoti Dam is present on the Alaknanda River where they wanted to construct a dam. It is a state government which has the authority to give a nod to the clearance that they wanted to construct a dam. Right. So, if you look into the state of Uttarakhand, the state of Uttarakhand alone has more than 40 45 hydroelectric power projects. 40 say 45 hydroelectric projects. Alone, Ganga River has more than 20 to 25, 20, more than 24 odd hydroelectric power projects. So, here the issue is that from the examination point of view, the sustainability of the Himalayas with respect to the dams that are constructed in the Himalayan tectonically active region. Firstly, you should know that. Himalayas are very tectonically active. Tectonically active means on the continuous movement, there is continuous movement in the Himalayas every now and then. So, it is a tectonically active dam. For example, you take the Tehri Dam. The Tehri Dam can withstand an earthquake of not more than 9 rector scale. But 9 rector scale earthquake in the Himalayas is something very, very magnanimous scale of earthquake. These dams can survive. But the rate of deposition and also the rate of dredging activities and the cost involved in this something which is bothering the construction of the dams. But here the World Bank which is now looking into this infrastructure as well as the construction of the Uttarakhand dam after many complaints have been given. Now, this is of a completely different orientation. See here there is a dam called Vishnugad Pipalakoti dam. Now, this dam is being built on the Alaknanda river and on that dam there is a temple which has its own origin with the Adi Shankaracharya. So, this dam is going to submerge the temple because of which the villagers who are residing in that they are going for protest. right? And also the World Bank is the one which is giving the functions and funds, funds state government ko de hai, right? The functions, sorry, it is the funds which are given by the World Bank. That is the reason why World Bank is asked to come and look into the construction of this dam. Because World Bank, if it is giving funding, it will also have the authority to look into the environmental concerns while it is giving funding to that project. Right Now, of course, the environmental concerns clearances will always be given by the state, central government with the help of the Ministry of Forestry and Climate Change. Right. So, here you should know that the World Bank has recently agreed to look into the construction of the Uttarakhand Dam. Why is it agreed to look into? Because funds are given by World Bank. Secondly, the name of the project is Vishnugad Pipalakoti Hydroelectric Power Project which is on the Alaknanda river. So, now Alaknanda itself is the tributary of Ganga. From the preliminary examination point of view, you should also be knowing the confluences of the river Ganga. Before the river Ganga, the river Ganga is called Ganga only after it enters into the Rishikesh area. Before that, it is not considered to be the river Ganga. Ganga river has various other names. It is called Alaknanda, it is has Bhagiratha as this tributary, Pindar, many other Mandakini. These are the tributaries of the Ganga before they come and join. Right. So, sorry, they are not the tributaries, I am really sorry. They are the rivers before they come and join the Ganga river. So, see here, just a minute. See, what is the news about? Once let us quickly read these two important points and then we will move further. The Vishnugad Pipalakoti hydroelectric project which is being built on the Alaknanda river will be investigated for the potential environmental harm by a World Bank independent panel. This independent panel is now agreed. See, suppose an independent panel wants to come to India and inquire. Do we allow them? The answer is no. You cannot allow them on a direct basis until and unless they do have some kind of interest and they are also funding on that particular project. So, India has agreed come look into the environmental concerns because the Ministry of Forestry and Climate Change already has given the clearances. right? So, this is the news article which is which we are going to discuss. And secondly, the committee has also agreed that 83 local communities ko inone ek saath lekar chal rahe. 
83 local communities they have already consulted and this 83 local communities they said that their concern is not with the environment but their concern is mostly associated with a temple called Lakshmi Narayan temple in the Hatti village which has its origin to the 19th century with Adi Shankara Charya. Adi Shankara Charya ke saath there are linkages with respect to this temple. Now, the concern, biggest concern here is that of course, environmental concerns ke saath saath there are also concerns associated with the cultural aspects. Here along with cultural aspects, you need to know that the rulings of the Supreme Court, okay. The Supreme Court ruling said that 2200 meters ke upar if there is any dam, sorry, if the, if the height of the area is more than 2200 meters in the Himalayas, you are not supposed to construct a big hydroelectric power project. Now, if you see this Vishnu Ghat power project, it is more than above 2200 meters and also there is a temple from the cultural aspects that Lakshminarayan temple in the Hathi village. Here from the examination point of view, we have to know about the architecture of this particular temple. Now, is it a Nagara style, Vesara style or a Dravida style? The answer here is, it is a temple which is constructed in the Nagara. Nagara type of architecture. Right. So, cultural and economic treasures of the community are something which are in trouble now. So, it was purportedly that Adi Shankaracharya is considered to be the sacred to the inhabitants and also the walls of the temple which are already impacted by the dam, they wanted them to stop the construction of the dam. Right, these are the ongoing issues. Apart from this, from the examination point of view, see, we have to also look into these confluences of the river Ganga. Have you ever heard of a concept that is Chardam Yatra? Chardam Yatra, recent time also, the government of India has planned to construct a Chardam Yatra road where they wanted to widen the roads of the Himalayas especially the roads that are connecting Emunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath and Badrinath. They wanted to build a road in the Uttarakhand region. But finally, the environmental clearances have not been given. That is the reason why the project has been dropped. Today, again, the same places are in use, the same articles are in use again and with respect to different connotations. So, here from the Badrinath, you have a river named Alaknanda. When Alaknanda meets Dauli Ganga, it is called as Vishnu Prayag, right? Once the Vishnu Prayag, from there again Alaknanda, it flows further down where it meets with Nanda Prayag. That confluence is called, that confluence is called, sorry, it meets with Nandakini and this confluence is called Nanda Prayag. Again, further when the Alaknanda river goes, it meets with Pindar Ganga. Here you call it as Karna Prayag. Then Alaknanda, when it meets with Bad, Mandakini, this Mandakini has its origin in the Kedarnath, that confluence is called Rudra Prayag, right. Now, Gangotri say Bhagiratha, the river that has originated and when it meets Alaknanda, it is called as Dev Prayag. And finally, when Yamuna meets Ganga at Alhabad, so it is actually Bhagiratha and Alaknanda which meets at Dev Prayag, from there this river is called as Ganga. Right? Now, where is Ganga originated? The, we generally say that Ganga is originated in Gangotri glacier. Right? Where is Yamuna river originated? Yamuna river is originated in Yamunotri glacier. Right? So, here if you have to understand, it is Yamunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath and Badrinath. These are the four major temple shrines which are considered to be as Chardam. Right? Let us move further. And there are some important from the preliminary examination point of view, there are some important major hydroelectric power projects in the last two years also this, kind, this type of questions that have been asked. So, let us quickly look into the major hydroelectric power projects in Uttarakhand. See, I have already told that Uttarakhand alone on the river Ganga itself, on the river Ganga itself there are more than 24 hydroelectric power projects and Uttarakhand in total on an average has 40 plus hydroelectric power projects, right. Out of this, the major power projects are Tehri, Tehri Garwal region or Tehri district is also there. It is in the location, the Tehri Garwal region. In the Garwal region, the Tehri, it is the one of the biggest dams of the Uttarakhand region because 
when this dam is constructed there was entire lar associations now what is this lar land acquisition rehabilitation and resettlement a entire district a people who are living in that district that they have been moved to a different place and relocated and resettled and this is a newly constructed dam in the recent times right now coming to the alaknanda hydroelectric project this is in srinagar that is pauri district and in the same pauri district there is another pro project called chila power project and most of these are on the river alaknanda or bagi rati theek hai ye jitne bhi major dams major projects jo hai they are presented on they are located on these rivers right ram ganga as well as maneri bali dam it is very difficult for me to pronounce if you know the right pronunciation please do comment down right see on a sample note this is the alaknanda river basin on the alaknanda river basin itself alone on the alaknanda river basin if you see there are more than more than 24 plus proposed projects alone on the river alaknanda i am talking about the alaknanda basin it is proposed that 24 hydroelectric power projects are being proposed to construct so here the issue is the environment versus the development environment versus the development in the environment versus development the development should always be sustainable in order to protect the environment right now what are the major challenges associated with the development of dams in the himalayas see himalayas as already i told you it is tectonically active when it is tectonically active the sedimentations are very very rapid so every time you construct a dam for example let me try to show this on a diagram the major challenges associated with the dams that are being constructed in the himalayas so imagine this is a river that flows and you plan to construct a dam here right you have constructed a dam and you built a big wall and from here the river goes across various hills and comes when the river that passes through the hills it has the tendency to cut down the slopes now what do you mean by cut down the slopes if you have ever visited the himalayas you will get to know that the rivers always cut down the bottom of the land right now this bottom cutting when it happens the sediments are carried down and they'll start to deposit in the form of boulders right boulders be hote small small pebbles and you start to fill this water right but the river is very active it is in the youth stage and this river will start to increase the sediments here okay increase the sediments so the life of the dam is not long now if you construct a dam in the southern Hem southern part of the peninsula where river gang river godavari or krishna the sediments are not strong sediments they won't be big big boulders that will be traveling all across those regions the rivers are calm the rivers usually flood but the flooding can be handled the life of the dams are very very large for long time period the dam life will be there but when you construct a dam in the himalayas usually the construction of a dam along with its maintenance the maintenance of the dam is very high why it is because there are huge sediments that will be deposited you have to take down these sediments right so when you open the gates of a dam the river of course it flows along with that it will also take up the sediments right in this sedimentation the process of dredging is something which is need to be taken care so the cost of maintenance is very very high and also just imagine if there is an earthquake and if the, the dam earthquakes are very very common in the himalayas every 2 or 3 months you will see an earthquake if there is a big earthquake the chances are that these kind of projects can be put into peril right now these are some of the challenges and also himalayas are considered to be the ecologically they are considered to be ecologically hotspots important areas and they are biodiversity hotspots so environmental importance is very very huge right so 
this is what is about the article and the last article which we are going to take up is the Ashok Gulati recently one of our famous scientists have written about the precision farming and that needs to be promoted and more output with less expenditure we need to look forward for. Under this considerations there are various methodologies which we can look forward. The article that has been written is mostly associated with the traditional farming methodologies but there are also many more articles which have been talked about the vertical farming and the types of vertical farming. So, again these kind of farming methodologies becomes very very important. Firstly, we should know about the types of vertical farming and what exactly is a vertical farming. Vertical farming is a farming where the usage of the land is less and the output of the product is more and the resources that are used for the production of a plant is very very less. So, ultimately when you use the less land and produce more amount of crops by using indoor farming this is called as vertical farming and this vertical farming can take place either indoor or also outdoor. If you have seen the metro pillars in the cities of Hyderabad, Delhi, Bombay what you see is that on those metro pillars there are series of plants which will be planted across on the top this is also called as vertical farming. But in a traditional sense the vertical farming includes four different types of farming. Before we deal with this firstly let us try to understand the importance of the vertical farming. Why do we need to go for vertical farming and is vertical farming a really future led technology where it can produce food security to the growing population? These are some of the questions which we have to look forward for. Now firstly by the year 2050 it is said that the population of the global world is going to be more than 9 billion. So under this range of population 2050 may it is estimated that 9 billion population is going to be there and there is going to be a rise in 60 percent of the food requirement plus the land and water jo hoga unka utility come mean the usage of the water and land it will increase usage will increase plus the fresh and good lands will be reduced. Now, this is called as double whammy of the agricultural sector along with this if you have other climatic crisis if you also have the climate change component if you add the climate change component to this this is going to be a disaster. Under these circumstances what we have to do is we have to look forward for new technologies these new technologies are nothing but vertical farming. Under this vertical farming majorly there are four different types of vertical farmings one is your hydrophonic, aerophonic and aquaphonic. Now, let us try to understand what is hydrophonic, aerophonic and aquaphonic. The fourth type is mostly it is using the light technology it is not much developed but whenever again it is in use we will be discussing that in detail. For today we will be taking up hydrophonics, aerophonics and aquaphonics what exactly are they right. See here. Okay, I think this picture better explains what kind of what is vertical farming. Your vertical farming can be done by using the cultivation type that is by using soil also. Firstly soil based vertical farming suppose you have a building in this big building there are various floors and you start to on the side walls if you put some soil and start to grow some crops. Now, this is also vertical farming, but the future technologies are mostly associated with these three types hydrophonics, aquaphonics and aerophonics. Hydrophonics hydro the word hydro itself says that it is water. Now, without using any soil you are going to develop and develop the growth of the plants. Now, how are you planning to do it by using the water. So, you will have the water under this water in this water the chemicals that are required for the growth of the plant is being induced into this water and these plants are placed into these kind of liquids. So, this kind of pl plants are called as hydrophonics. Now, what is aerophonics? If this is hydrophonics, what is aerophonics? The word itself says that aero, air, right? Aerophonics means you generally without using soil, no soil usage. usage of spray of chemicals of chemicals on the what you will do is generally 
you will suspend the plants if this is your plant you will suspend the plant roots in a closed environment and then you will start to spray the the chemicals on these roots instead of suspending them in the water what you are doing you are simply spraying the chemicals onto this plant now this is called as aerophonics right let me try to show you okay see here here you have water here also you have water aquaphonics will be discussing now and in this no water you are not going to use any water right you are only going to spray this is called as aerophonics now coming to the aquaphonics aquaphonics is one such technology where fisheries are also being utilized fishes are also being utilized to grow the plants now this can be grown in different types see here you can also see some fishes within the plants fishes give out some kind of excreta that can be used by these plants but there is another methodology in which the aquaphonics uses the layering of aquaphonic technologies mean suppose here in this there are vertical layers and in the vertical layers you start to grow the fishes right and from here the water that is used will now be utilized for the growth of the plant because fish always needs fresh water right fish always needs fresh water in this the plantation which you use it will use the nutrients that have been added by the fish and this same water will be utilized by the plant once the plant utilizes this water this water freshness will again increase because the nutrients take up all the impurities or the, all the raw, all the nutrients that are present in this excreta of the fish again the same water will be used to recycle it will be recycled and again it will be used for the fishes right now this is called as aquaphonics this is one type of aquaphonic and the other type of aquaphonic is you directly start to grow the fishes in this right so it is also helping the fishes to grow it is also helping the plants to grow it is nothing but the effective utilization of the resources that are available in a limited space right now what kind of plantations that can be grown here if you see mostly in the cultivation types of the soil based there are leafy green vegetables but hydrophonics usually the fruits of tomato see tomato is not a vegetable it is a fruit always remember right see the fruits of tomato or today we use it as vegetables right so tomatoes are the most prominently developed fruits in the recent times climatic control dono ki zarurat hai in mein soil based technology we generally use the light what kind of light we use we use led lights here right and in the aquaphonics mostly automation technology is required whereas in the aerophonics biotechnology is required right aerophonics requires biotechnology now here all these vertical farming technologies are costly in nature a normal farmer cannot afford this right so costly process tomorrow if the more effective technologies if they come into picture and give if the government is in a position to give this kind of subsidies the problem of population with respect to the food security can easily be met right so let me quickly show you the uh, diagrams here this is aerophonics where the sprinkling of the water is used and uh, when the suspended plants are being placed and when it comes to hydrophonics water along with this water air pumps the refreshment of water will be used and lastly fisciculture or aquaculture in this the same water will again be used by the fishes and also it will be used by the plants right now along with this there are also green buildings which are in use now what are these green buildings green buildings are nothing but the amount of energy that is being used by this building is generated from its own sources whether it is from solar and also this is a ecologically neutral building or environmentally climate forcing mein jo hai it is actually reducing the environmental impact it is taking the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere rather it is giving out more oxygen to the atmosphere every construction if you start to construct a building the building has methane in it the cement composition has methane in it it has a greenhouse gas so construction also requires sorry construction also emits out the greenhouse gases right so if you have a building of this sort the green buildings can also add to the reduction in the environmental impact now these are some of the various types of technologies which have been in news of in the recent one past one week 
I hope, I think we have added some value to your preparation and also seize the means where a question will be added in the description on these topics. Please make sure to write those uh, answers and uh, submit to the seize the means. You will be eval the answers will be evaluated by uh, experts and also you will get a very good feedback. Make sure to experience the best faculties that have been in touch with you, right. And if you have any doubts, you can also message me here 738255230. This is my contact number. Any doubts that are related to these topics, I will be addressing your doubts also. Thank you.